Our Bible study today is on Daniel chapter 1, beginning at verse 17. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, as we continue through the book of Daniel, we thank you that we have an opportunity to see how Daniel and these uh, young men uh, responded to the temptations of their secular society that they were uh, taken into in Babylon, that they uh, lived for you, O Lord, not because of the rewards or the protections that they might receive by being faithful, but simply because you are worth worshiping in all circumstances. Lord, may our faith be as strong that we might recognize that uh, our worship and our love for you is, um, is the reward in and of itself. In Jesus' name, amen. So in Daniel chapter 1, we had looked at the background of Daniel, how he was taken into the exile, how his, uh, him and his f- three friends were given Babylonian names, and then what was incorporated into, the, uh, into what is considered to be like the wise men school, right? So this was a kind of a training that the Babylonian Empire had for people who were um, you know, well-educated, people who had aptitude, uh, because, you know, the, the Babylonian em- emperor, Nebuchadnezzar, w- wasn't interested in just destroying everybody. The Assyrians were pretty good at, like, just killing people randomly. But Babylon was more interested in, like, you know, taking over. So, you know, he had placed Israel under, um, under the um, uh, vassalage, right? which is, you know, he was the, em- uh, the emperor would have been the suzerain, and a suzerain is like a person who's like an emperor who's in control of a large area, and he forces the other kings to be vassals. That means that they have to uh, show their um, loyalty to to the king, uh, to the emperor, and they do that by sending tribute money. So in, in essence, it's kind of like a Italian mafia. It's basically extor- uh, international extort- extortation, extortation, Extor- extortion, extortion. That's it. There you go. International extortion. So they were, you know, getting the, uh, the money in order to not destroy the city of Jerusalem. And so, but even before Jerusalem was destroyed, you know, this is, again, part of the background that's on the sheet here, is that King Nebuchadnezzar had already deported people from the northern part. And, uh, and so at 605 B.C., already, some people, it was kind of like a punishment to show them he was in control. And so they took away a lot of, People. So part of, the, of those people in that first round of the exile, and so if, when you're reading through the Bible, most of the time we talk about the exile of Judah beginning at 586. That's the year that Jerusalem was destroyed. But it actually started in 605 when the first wave of people were taken into, uh, into Babylon. So Daniel was a young man. The word, as I was studying it, um, it, t- it tells us, as a young man, that, that's kind of like the Hebrew phrase for adolescent. So, you know, that means you had to be older than 13 because that's when you become a, a bar mitzvah. You know, you, you become a son of the, of the law, right? So uh, bar mitzvah mean, is uh, kind of like confirmation. Mm-hmm. It's a, a coming of age. And so as a young man, he could have been anywhere between 13 and, and 18. Uh, so because it says he was young, most likely he was around 13 or 14 years old when he was taken in 605. And then he uh, retired after Nebuchadnezzar was, um, his kingdom was destroyed by the Persian Empire, Cyrus took over, and then the text even ends in the end of chapter 1 saying that he remained there, that is in Babylon, until the first year of King Cyrus. And so we know that he wrote the book of Daniel after he was retired and he was living in Persia. And so he was probably 81 or 82 at that time. Uh, Okay, so um, we also looked at the beginning of this first test where uh, Daniel and the three young men, his friends, uh, that's Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, were drafted and, you know, they were told that they had to eat the food of the king, right, from the king's table. And uh, everything that came from the king's table had been dedicated to the idols first. So the meat was sacrificed to idols. So if you know anything about Leviticus, it says you shall not eat meat that's unkosher. So certain types of meat you can't eat. And certain, uh, you can't eat the meat that has blood in it, and you can't eat any meat that's offered to idols. So 
you know, right off the top, all those, all that was off limits to them. And then the wine that was offered along with the meat as part of their, you know, their uh, meal or their dietary um, well, supplements uh, was also offered as sacrifices to the idols, right? So a liquid sacrifice is called an oblation. And, you know, so they're not going to drink the wine. They're not going to eat the meat. No matter how good it tasted, they wanted to refuse those things in order to show the Lord their faithfulness to his Torah, to the law. And, you know, do we, as Christians, would we say that, that you are defiled by what you eat or what you drink? No. And where do we get that from? Why, why do we not have, follow the kosher laws? Very good. That's right. Jesus, okay, well, earlier in Jesus' ministry, in John, uh, sorry, Mark chapter 10, he says, um, he says, it's not what goes into your mouth that makes you evil, but what comes out of your heart. And then it says, and thus Jesus proclaimed all foods to be clean. And then, of course, the dream of Peter, where Jesus says to him, get up, kill, and eat. And he says, oh, Lord, my lips have never touched anything uh, unkosher or unclean. And then God says, do not call unclean what I have called clean. And then at the end of those three, he had three visions, and then he, God told him, or Jesus said, that a man is going to come to you to take you to a, a centurion named Cornelius, and you're going to go to his house. And so God is actually commanding him, Jesus commanding him to go to a Gentile's house, which seems to go against the Old Testament law. But it's not that Gentiles were evil or off limits. It's that their practices were. So, you know, are there examples of Gentiles in the Old Testament who were accepted by God? Yeah. Rahab, the prostitute from Jericho who became a believer, and you know she ended up becoming a part of Jesus' genealogy. And uh, Ruth. Ruth, that's right, Ruth, so a Moabitess. So you got these people who are examples of God receiving and accepting faithful uh, people outside of Israel. So it wasn't as if that was what the kosher laws are about. It's not like God made up these laws and said, now I'm going to make some people to make sure these laws are kept so that these laws could be you know, raised up and glorified. No, it was the other way around. God made people first. He made them in a perfect harmony with him. And when they broke the law, the laws were placed to show us our sin and to show us our need for a savior. And so and Jesus showed that in, when he did things like healed people on the Sabbath. You know, they, the, the, peop, the Jewish leaders were saying he was breaking the law. And he said, no, God made this law to show how we were to love God and to love our neighbor. And you love your neighbor best by helping them, not by, you know, leaving them on the road to die because it's a Sabbath and I can't do, do any work. Right. So uh, understanding the true meaning, the, the spirit of the law, as opposed to the letter of the law. Right. A lot of people love to find loopholes and to find ways. You know, kids are really good at that. Right. You know, you tell them, uh, uh, I want you to. Uh, clean your room and, and then there might be like a towel laying in the doorway and then they say technically it's not in my room it's on the doorway it's in the hallway so and then, you know well that's not what you meant when you said clean so you know kids are good at finding loopholes like lawyers are and uh, and the Pharisees as well and God didn't want us to do that he wants us to to fulfill the spirit of the law and the spirit of the law is love and so the the young men are not um, avoiding the foods because they're trying to be holier than thou. They're avoiding the foods of the table of uh, Nebuchadnezzar because they want to be a witness to the truth that there's only one God and that the God of the Babylonians or the gods of the Babylonians are false gods. You know, and Nebuchadnezzar thought he was a god as well. So that god was false as well. Okay, so now we're in the section where we heard how Daniel had already um, been... He, asked the guard, and the guard's name was, um, let's see, Ashpenaz. Ashpenaz, and so he, God turned his heart towards Daniel so that he would actually listen to Daniel. He could have been stubborn and said, if you're not going to do what I tell you to do, I'm going to kill you. He, he could have done that. But instead, he said, you know, oh, I don't want to get in trouble with, with the king if you get sick. So, and then Daniel made, a, made the option, he says, well, just feed us vegetables and water and see for healthy in 10 days and of course god god's provision was to care for them so they would still be healthy you know not that you know eating vegetables will make you weak but in 
an ancient culture, if that's all you ate and you were offered something better, you know, because in the ancient world, most people were not fat or overweight. They lived hand to mouth. They, you basically worked every day to earn the food to survive. So if you had an opportunity to receive the food that will help you survive, and they probably, these guys were probably not farmers, and you know, so they, they might not make it out in the world on their own, and they're being offered this wonderful food, why would they turn it down? That, that's a, it's kind of like a death sentence. When you live in a, a, we live in an age where food is so common that in the United States, 30% of our food is wasted. It either, it, it either rots, doesn't make it to the, uh, to the supermarket, or it is thrown away from the supermarket because it's over its date, or it starts to spoil, or people buy it, and then they, it spoils in their refrigerator, and they just throw, or they just throw it away. So there's a lot of waste. In the ancient world, it wasn't like that. People you know, ate what they had because that's all they had. That's right, and that's another thing. No refrigerators, so they didn't have an o the option. So that's why any meat that was offered to them it wasn't steaks that had been aged in refrigeration. It was something that had been killed that day as a sacrifice on the altar of the Babylonian gods. So they, they knew where the f food was coming from, offered at the temple. It's because temples in the ancient world were bas basically butcher shops. And even in the New Testament, the same thing is true. When Paul says, you know, eating meat offered to idols, it doesn't really make any difference because we know that idols are nothing, right? This is 1 Corinthians chapter 10. And he says... But uh, if somebody who has a weak faith sees you eating meat offered to idols and thinks, oh, those Christians seem to not care about if they worship Yahweh or they worship Jesus or they worship, you know, Aphrodite. So maybe it's okay for me too. And that could lead a person astray. So you shouldn't allow that to happen. You need to be a good witness of your faith. But he says, if your faith is strong, and you know, you don't need to worry about that. But, but back in Daniel's time, their reason for doing it was not to try to be holier or to try to do anything other than to show their love for the Lord through obedience and also to be a witness. <coughs> okay, so we're in verse uh, 17. And this is after the, um, the test was kind of over and they seemed healthy. Okay, so could somebody read verse 17? So we see that besides keeping them healthy, and, and notice it doesn't specifically ever say that God is the one who did this, right? It, it doesn't say, and God kept them healthy, right? And it does, but here it does say that God gave them knowledge and understanding. So, you know, it, this is written for, you know, who's the audience of this book? Christians, or, well, uh, Jewish believers or, or believers in God. So... Because it was uh, written to believers, you know, they don't need to write down, you know, oh, God's the one who kept them healthy. That's, that's the assumption that's underlying it. But then it does specifically tell us that God gave them other things. So notice that these blessings, what kind of blessings did the four young men receive? Okay, the first one, the, some, some of your Bibles may say wisdom, and the NIV it says knowledge and understanding of all kinds of literature and learning. Learning and skill. Skill and all that. Sure. Okay. Learning, skill, visions. So I think that technically there's four things that are listed here. So there's knowledge, there's understanding of literature, and then uh, understanding visions and dreams. So. And the last two belong to Daniel. That's right. And understanding of Okay, well, it, it doesn't say that only Daniel had this, it does, but it does label him. And the they reason had it, these things, and Daniel had understanding and visions and dreams. And, and, well, and, that, and the reason why that sentence is there is to prepare us for what's going to happen in chapters uh, 2, 4, and 5, which is where Daniel uses that interpretation skill to uh, interpret the dreams of Nebuchadnezzar and others. So the first one there, knowledge. It's, it actually isn't the word wisdom. There's a word for wisdom in Hebrew, and that's not the word that's used here. But it is a, a synonym for the word wisdom. So what kind of knowledge do you think it's talking about? For the very first word? 
they gave uh, God gave knowledge. Okay, so yeah, okay, so learning may be another way of translating the word. The um, the the word in the Hebrew it refers to um, not just intellectual knowledge, which is you know if you say learning that that specifically is intellectual knowledge, but the word is is more general. It's, it includes intellectual knowledge, but also um, awareness of of situations and how to live a right life. Yeah, that actually is a good way of describing it. Um, so it has to do with understanding things and knowing how to do things. So there's all kinds of places in the Bible that, um, that gives us explanation of this. Let's look at Proverbs 2, verse 5, that uses the same word. Okay, and then i got a couple other places that we can look up. Anybody got that one? Proverbs 2, verse 5. Okay, so notice that so in Hebrew, um, Hebrew poetry, and you, you know that your text is in Hebrew poetry if it's indented. So not every Bible does this, but more modern Bibles like the NIV, ESV usually do. So in the Proverbs, as well as in the Psalms, you can see it's indented. And they use something called parallelism. And parallelism is where you take two lines and you, con or you show... The same thing twice, you know, so you, you're using syn synonyms here. So if the final sentence of verse 5 says to find the knowledge of God, then that means that it's, it is synonymous with understanding the fear of the Lord. So Because uh, if you think about, you know, a person who has knowledge, we might think about an intellectual scholar, a person who, you know, is like a teacher or knows lots of stuff, but it's in parallelism with understanding the fear of the Lord. And what does that mean? What is to understand the fear of the Lord? Okay, yeah. And, uh, Proverbs 1, verse 7 says that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. So, and the fear of the Lord would be, I don't know if you guys remember, whenever I talk about what the fear of the Lord means, first of all, the English word for fear is not a good translation. Most of the time, we don't know what that means. People, I've had people tell me, that, you know, I, I can't believe in a God that wants me to be afraid of him. You know, what kind of, that sounds like an evil thing. What kind of a God would, you know, hold us humans, you know, in, in some type of a fear? And see, that's a misunderstanding of the word. The word fear of the Lord has more to do with faith and love. In fact, I would, you know, challenge you, if, whenever you're reading the Bible and you see the word fear of the Lord, just change it to the love of the Lord. And it's the same, it's the same thing. It's what actually better. Awe. Awe. awe is a good thing, but that you can have awe and be frightened. As but I, when we're, and reverence is a good one, but I think it's too weak. I think that the love of the Lord is the uh, is really what it's intending to mean. Yeah, so one of the things that Luther did is that he, he loved to use multiple syn synonymous terms in order to get a point across, and just to make sure that nobody missed it. So in the Ten Commandments, his explanation of each commandment, he says, you know, what is the first commandment? You shall, uh, it says, you know, you shall have no other gods, and then his explanation is, you shall fear, love, and trust God above all things. See, those three terms are the best way of, encapsulating the fear of the Lord. To fear, love, and trust God. That's what the fear of the Lord is. It's to fear him, but to have, in the biblical sense, to love him and to trust him or have faith. Don't forget that Luther wasn't writing in English, so we got a double translation. <laughs> That's true. Right. But the German and the English are closer than the, than the English and the Hebrew. Yeah. So... Uh, okay, that was the passage from Proverbs. Another one that helps us is Ecclesiastes 7, verse 12. Ecclesiastes 7, 12. Okay, does somebody have that one? 
freedoms or shelter or as money as they shelter, but the advantage of knowledge is this, that wisdom preserves the, li the life of its possessor. Okay, so you can see that you know, knowledge is being used uh, synonymously with the word wisdom, but then in that second part of the sentence where it says, the advantage of knowledge is this, that it's that wisdom preserves the life of its possessor. So that's, this is a good way of understanding that when it tells us that Daniel had, was, and the, the other young men in Babylon were given knowledge, that meant that they had this um, gift from God that allowed them to be able to have their lives preserved because God gave them this gift, this gift of knowledge. So that's why I think that it's uh, good to describe this as an awareness of one's situation and how to live according to God's will. Okay, uh, there's a, a nice New Testament passage that kind of gives us an insight into this as well. 2 Peter 1, verse 3. Of course, Peter was, he was, you know, Jewish, and so his understanding of Scripture uh, influenced his uh, writings. 2 Peter 1, verse 3. Verse 3. The divine power has granted to us all things that pertain to life and godliness, through the knowledge of him who called us to his own glory and excellence, by which he, by which he has granted to us his precious, precious and very great promises. Okay, so then it, the word knowledge is in there. So what, and this is the, this would be the Greek word that is translating the Hebrew word. And we know that because uh, there's, a, there's a Greek translation of the Old Testament called the Septuagint. And it uses the same word that Peter uses here to, to translate the word that we are looking at in Daniel. So uh, Peter is telling us that if you have the knowledge of him, that is, you know, of God, who called us by his own glory and goodness, or you could say of Jesus, what is that going to do? Uh, what what okay so it, it gives you uh they were called the glory and goodness that it's uh according to his promises he's given he gives us everything we need for life and godliness so knowledge is the conduit through which god gives us everything we need for life and godliness so you can see the whole idea about godliness is is that this is not just intellectual knowledge this is knowledge about how to live rightly. So it's, it's kind of a moral knowledge. You know, think about how our world does not possess that type of knowledge. What they do is they call evil good and, and they call good evil, right? I mean, there's people who are being called, uh, taken up uh, for hate crimes who are Christian pastors simply speaking the word of God. You know, a good example of that is, uh, or a bad example, infamous example, is uh, the there's a Lutheran bishop in Finland who a year and a half ago was brought up in charges of, uh, of hate crime and, uh, in Finland because he wrote a, a pamphlet about uh, that marriage is only between a man and a woman. And he wrote this before Finland passed the law against hate crimes for uh, disparaging you know, homosexual relationships. It was like written in the late 90s, and then they just law didn't even get put on the books until you know the, the mid 2000s or something like that, 2010, 2015, and he still was brought up for charges, and then he was he was acquitted, and then the um, the Supreme Court of Finland uh, took it back again, and they uh, they appealed, right? So they wanted to bring charges against this guy to put him in jail for this, and so, and so and he won that court as well. And that happened last, either last January or sometime last, at the end of last year. And then the Supreme Court of Finland appealed to the Supreme Court of the European Union because, I mean, look at this. The guy who, and he did not say, and he still does not say that he hates homosexuals. He doesn't say that he's against homosexuals. He simply says that God's desire for marriage is between one man and one woman and union and uh, in love for Christ, and that and that that's not God's intention to have these other kinds of relationships. And he's saying, now not saying that he's against them. In fact, if they come to his church, he'll welcome them. I bet he'll share the good news about what God's will is. And so, but they they just don't like that. And so they're saying that he is the evil one, and that he is preaching hate. 
as opposed to what the government seems to be doing. And so this is just a precursor of the kinds of stuff that's going to happen in the future um, in the Western world that becomes more secular, kind of like Babylon. In fact, we're getting back to Babylon, unfortunately. You know, we're in, in some ways, uh, America was more like a like the um, the twelve apostles in the beginning of the first century when they were sharing the good news with the, the Jewish people in Judea. Uh, now. We're, we're really in a world that's more like St. Paul going to Athens where he's talking to people who have no clue about the Bible or they're biblically illiterate and so we need to start from scratch. Okay, so back in Daniel 1 verse 17. So the word knowledge has a lot to it that has to do with spiritual as well as uh, moral understanding. But then the second word there, the word understanding, and at least in NIV, what does it say in like the ESV or some of the other translations? The second word is says under. Word when he's talking about all four. The second word when he's talking about Daniel. Okay, so it says the four to these four young men God gave knowledge and understanding. What does it say in the NIV or the ESV? Skill. skill. Okay, so skill is the second verb there. Yeah, so it's because it talks about the understanding of all the all kinds of literature and learning. So the Babylonian uh, school for these uh, wise men, in essence, this is what the Magi were, right? During the time of the Persian Empire, the Persians just continued on. So what happened is that Daniel was in this um, wise men school, and by the time the Persians took over, they just took all the people who are wise men from the Babylonians, and then they, they became the, uh, the ones who talked to the king of the Persian Empire. He, he just used them as, uh, as his you know, sounding board. And, uh, and so he, that probably continued throughout the Persian Empire. So we know that Daniel would have been uh, you know, in his 80s when he finally kind of retired, but he would, would have organized and kept that thing going so that 400 years later, we see that what happened when the Magi came looking for the baby Jesus, they are able to do that because Daniel had already established the types of, uh, maybe like the curriculum that they were using. Sure, they were, they were reading the stuff that you mentioned, the uh, Babylonian, um, the, the pantheon of the gods, right? So you have to know about the gods of the Babylonian Empire. And then last week when we talked about the names of that were given to Daniel and his three friends, they were all given names of Babylonian gods, like, you know, a servant of Nebo, right? So, like, a, that was the uh, third name, the Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Abednego means servant of Nebo, and Nebo was like, I don't know, what did I say last week, the moon god or something? So the, each of these is a god in the Babylonian Empire. So people had to learn these things, but just because you learn about them doesn't mean that you believe in them. So it'd be like, you know, when, when a person goes through high school, you have to read the Iliad and the Odyssey, and you're reading about gods of the Greek and Roman Empire, and you, you know, you don't believe those are real, but it's good literature. It's interesting literature. It's important to know these things. And that's what Daniel was doing. He had to learn the literature of the Babylonians. But he also, because he became the one who probably was able to lead and to plan the curriculum, probably introduced the Jewish scriptures into the hands of those um, of those future uh, wise men. So that's why the ones that studied the uh, Old Testament prophecies were looking for a king born in Bethlehem. Well, at first they weren't sure where he was going to be born. They, went, they looked for the king of the Jews because they saw the star that led them to, to Jerusalem. So that's all the background behind Daniel. But this wisdom and this knowledge that he has the, uh, the word understanding can, sometimes can be translated as insight. And so we're talking about um, kind of like a spiritual insight, not just, um, yeah, not just understanding, but uh, the ability to, to know, what, um, you know what, what's going to be useful and how to use it. So for instance, let's look at the beginning of Proverbs 1. So Proverbs 1 gives us kind of a description of this type of, of, this type of understanding. Uh, like King Solomon had. Uh, chapter 1, verses 1 through 7. 
Yeah, so it would be the first seven verses of Proverbs. Yeah, one, one through seven. The Proverbs of Solomon, son of David, king of Israel, to know wisdom and instruction, to understand words of insight, to receive instruction in wise dealing, in righteousness, justice, and equity, to give prudence to the simple, knowledge and discretion to the youth. Let the wise hear and increase in learning, and the one who understands will attain guidance, to understand a proverb and a saying, words of the wise and their riddles. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Fools despise wisdom and instruction. Okay, thank you. So just as Daniel and the, the young men were given understanding of all kinds of literature and learning, you know, here it's talking about um, that King Solomon uh, was sharing the Proverbs and of course, the book of Proverbs isn't just by Solomon. It includes some uh, additions by other kings of Israel in the future, uh, after the time of Solomon. But he definitely is the author of the first sections, probably like through the first two-thirds of the book. And uh, it talks about here that to attain wisdom and discipline, for understanding words of insight, for acquiring discipline and prudent life. So each one of these things, how do we have these things? What is... What is the way in which a person attains <coughs> discipline and understanding and knowing what's right from what's wrong? It's, it's by pursuing, pursuing wisdom, right? So wisdom is pictured in this book, uh, the book of Proverbs. It starts out, you know, kind of like it's Proverbs, like saying, you know, oh, if you want to be wise, this is what it means to be wise. But as you go further, it actually... Get, uh, starts to personify wisdom because wisdom is pictured as a uh, a woman of nobility and she calls out from the rooftops and she says whoever wants to uh, live listen to me and she she calls the simple people who uh, you know are naive I guess is the word to describe what that's talking about it says she calls those who are simple and it says listen to me and you will live and you know and then that's contrasted at the end like in chapters uh, six and seven, with, uh, with the opposite of, of lady wisdom, right? So if lady wisdom is a, uh, a noble woman of moral integrity, then what's the opposite of that? What's foolishness pictured as in the book of Proverbs? A weak woman? That's right. It's pictured as an as a adulteress, mm -hmm. right? An adulteress. And so those, that's a, 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 some picture language that leads us to understand the difference between pursuing wisdom and understanding, which is what Daniel and his three friends are doing, which is to listen to lady wisdom, as opposed to listening to uh, foolishness, which is the uh, adulteress. For instance, let's see if I can find it. Um, uh, if you turn to Proverbs chapter 5, It, it contrasts in the beginning, talking about wisdom, it says, My son, pay attention to my wisdom. Listen well to my words of insight. That's a similar word to what we just looked at. That you may maintain dis discretion and, that, and your lips may preserve knowledge. For the lips of the adulteress drip honey, and her speech is smoother than oil. But in the end, she is bitter as gall, sharp as a double-edged sword. Her feet go down to death. Her steps lead straight to the grave. Uh, and, and so there's a, there's a description there, but later on it, it talks about uh, uh, foolishness from the perspective of the adulteress. Uh, let's see. I think it, I'm not sure where it is. Um, oh, well, the end of chapter 6 and, and the beginning of chapter 7 all talk about this. Uh, about the um, foolishness as personified by a, uh, a brazen woman. So it talks about how she, she says, for instance, in chapter 7, verse, uh, verse 14. Uh, this is uh, foolishness speaking. She says, I have fellowship offerings at home. Today I fulfilled my vows. So I came out to meet you and looked for you and have found you. I have covered my bed with co colored linens from Egypt. I have perfumed my bed with myrrh, aloes, and cinnamon. Come, let's drink of 
love till morning. Let's enjoy ourselves with love. Verse 19, my husband is not at home. He has gone on a long journey. He took his purse filled with money and he will not be home till full moon. So she's basically saying, hey, let's fool around because we won't get caught. You know, it's a pretty racy section, but, but that is a, a metaphor for the difference between wisdom, which is a woman of nobility, and foolishness, which is a, uh, an adulteress, right? And, you know, when I read this uh, in my Old Testament class at Concordia, and, you know, sometimes people kind of get bent out of shape, like, you know, well, gosh, that's not nice to just uh, focus in on women as being the ones who lead men astray. And, and so it's important to recognize that who, who's speaking in the beginning of the book of Proverbs? Wisdom. Yeah, well, the very beginning, it says Solomon is, is saying these things to his son. So, of course, he's giving advice to his son. So if we are a parent giving advice to our children, then it doesn't matter if you're speaking to a, a boy or a girl as long as you uh, help them to understand that uh, promiscuity leads to death because it's against God's will and that God's desire is that we live lives of integrity and that we follow God's will, right? So following wisdom is following God's will and wisdom calls us to listen to her because wisdom in the Hebrew is a, is a feminine word. But in chapter eight of Proverbs, wisdom is not, no longer just a personification, but all of a sudden it becomes an entity because what ha it says in Proverbs 8, verse 31 through 33, wisdom says, I was there in the beginning when God created the world and I delighted in creating mankind. I was like a child at his side. So, and the word there for child in the Hebrew is the word for, it could either mean child or it could mean craftsman. So who is the child at God's side who helped create everything, who is also a craftsman or carpenter? That's, that is, you, you can't get any more uh, obvious uh, description of Jesus. And so Jesus is ultimately the wisdom of God that is the personification of God from Proverbs chapter 8. Uh, so, of course, Daniel would have known these things, and the pursuit of knowledge and wisdom is not an end in, unto itself. That would be sinful. That would be prideful and, and uh, arrogant. But instead, the reason why they're pursuing knowledge is because it is the knowledge of God, ultimately. It is learning the literature of the Babylonians for the sake of being a, able to speak to the king in his own language, the things that he understands, so they could be good witnesses to him from God, right? They're not going to give up their faith, but they're going to stand before the king and witness to him. So the whole book of Daniel is about witnessing, as well as, you know, apocalyptic descriptions of the future, both for their future, which we see, you know, with like the, the statue that Nebuchadnezzar sees in his dream, and then he makes it himself, and he forces people to worship it, and then ultimately way into the future, it talks about the coming of the Messiah, and then the end times, you know, Jesus' return. Okay, so if we go back to uh, Daniel 1, verse 18, can someone read that? At the end of the time, set by the king to bring them in, the chief official presented them to Nebuchadnezzar. So notice that it wasn't, uh, it wasn't Ashpenaz's job to do the final selection. He did his job of preparing them, making sure they were healthy, making sure they're eating right, and then, you know, makes this side deal with him. Oh, don't, if you're not going to eat the meat, then at least you have to be healthy. And so by 10 days later, they could see they were healthy. And then they were brought before King Nebuchadnezzar. So, you know, Nebuchadnezzar is one of those people who he had to have his finger in every single pie. He, there's, a, there's a psychological description of his, um, of his uh, thought processes. He was a megalomaniac, right? Meg a megalomaniac is a person who, who has... Um, uh, visions of grandeur, a person who believes that they are divine and that no, they are never wrong. And as a result, you know, he had to be the one who made the final decision. You know, there's nothing wrong with that necessarily, but God's going to use this to, uh, to, to God's advantage because if Nebuchadnezzar chooses them, he can't blame anybody when these young men do something that he doesn't like because he chose them. 
right? You know, he, they were super wise. He could see that they were very uh, well, they were articulate. So let's look at verse 19. So just as uh, Nebuchadnezzar uh, came to interview all of the of the uh, wise young men, and we're we're talking about people from not only from the Jewish culture, but other cultures as well. So these would have been uh, young men who were uh, educated in the Babylonian culture, as well as you know the Jewish culture, and it could have been other cultures as well, because you know the Babylonians have conquered lots of different areas. And one of the things that they did is they would take people from one city or country and move them to another country in order to force them to, um, yeah, to so they, it, they would break down their uh, allegiances, right? So, you know, if someone, to, uh, if someone destroyed uh, America and then they transported all of us from Santa Barbara to Canada, would you ever start an uprising in Canada to take over the country? Well, no, that's not our country. We, don't, we may not be interested in doing that. And that's, that kind of defeated the idea of trying to start a civil war by the people who were exiles. Uh, so there could have been people from Syria and other countries, um, maybe northern Israel. Or it, northern Israel had already been destroyed by the Assyrians and had already been integrated with other foreigners so that they intermarried and they ended up being called Samaritans. So even some of those Samaritans were, the Jewish people looked down on them as worse than Gentiles because they knew the truth and then they gave it up by intermarrying with the Canaanites. Uh, but, you know, Babylonians probably didn't care about that and they just were looking for people who were smart. And as Nebuchadnezzar gives a, um, an interview, uh, this is an amazing sentence. The king talked with him and found none equal to these four young men. And it used, he here it uses the Hebrew names, right? Because back in, in verse nine, uh, 6, that is, it listed their names as Belshazzar, uh, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, right? Here it's, now, verse 19, we can see that because it tells us that Nebuchadnezzar talked to these four young men and it uses their Hebrew names, this chapter is written in Hebrew, but do you guys remember that I mentioned, this is on the sheet here, that chapters 2 through 7 are written in a different language. What language is that? Uh, the Aramaic language. right? So uh, the Aramaic language is the language that was used in the Persian Empire. It uses the Hebrew letters, but it is a different language. So, you know, why is, uh, is it mentioning that the, uh, the young men from the perspective of their Hebrew names because the cha chapter 1, as well as the very end, chapters 8 through 12, which were written in Hebrew, are written for the, uh, for the exiles. And the middle section was most likely written either using official documentation from the Persian Empire about what happened, as well as a witness to the people who spoke that language, which would have been maybe some of the Babylonians as, as well as the Persians. So, it, you know, the Persians or the Babylonians might say, well, we don't read in Hebrew. And so they, they wouldn't have known anything about what the first chapter meant or the last couple of chapters. Uh, so this, it shows that the book is, has a purpose of trying to reach other audiences besides the, uh, besides the believers. Now, we know that the main audience, of course, was the believers because they were the ones who were being persecuted, the Jewish people in exile, and God was trying to encourage their faith as they uh, experienced the... Um, these uh, uh, persecutions, right? Because you know the whole the whole beginning of the book is all about you know one story of persecution after another. You know Daniel is told you know eat this food or we're gonna or you're gonna get killed. You know and then he says well I'm not gonna eat it. Well, what's gonna happen? Is he gonna get killed? Well it he, it works out in this one, but then the next couple of chapters things turn around where you know he he's gonna be killed because he because because the king is angry that none of the wise men can tell him what his dream is or what it means. And then Daniel was never consulted until he was about to be executed. And then later on, the three young men with the fiery furnace, they're being told to worship an idol, and they won't do that. So, so it's persecution after persecution, and how do they react to these things? 
Uh, and we had already talked about what the meanings of their names were last week. So how about verse 20? We'll finish off the chapter. And every matter of wisdom and understanding about which the king questioned him, he found them ten times better than all the magicians and enchanters in, in his whole kingdom. So not only does it tell us that in the previous verse that Nebuchadnezzar found them none equal to them, but now it even goes even further. So, I mean, how, what do you think it means that, sa that says he found them ten times better than these other people? I mean, is that a legitimate claim? I mean, how, how do you measure ten times intelligent? Well, he questioned them. Right. So, uh, I would say that um, this is called... this in. There's a thing called numerology, right? Numerology is, is the study of the significance of numbers in the Bible. So in the Bible, do you, what does the number 10 represent? 10 represents the highest. That's right. Yeah. So it so, uh, usually means like, you know, perfection or, or completeness, right? And so, you know, and sometimes you can, in English, we can, you know, say, you know, multiply something by 10 to say, you know, it's like, you know, it's, it's great. You know, or maybe if you cube it, you know, that's multiplied by a thousand. That's the greatest. And, and so that's the idea. The whole idea of having it ten times better is simply a Hebrew euphemism for, um, you know, they, they were the smartest, right? Because there's no actual way of measuring the, um, the, uh, the if, if you could, do, could have done an IQ test on these people, their IQ test would not have been ten times higher than the IQs of everybody else. That's, that's very unlikely. But it's just a way of describing that they were the smartest. But who were they smarter than? And list, it lists a couple of the groups. Magicians and enchanters. That's right. So what is an, a magician? Cast spells, right? Okay. So it, and that might be something that we might uh, think of today. That, I think that that idea of a magician as a sorcerer comes from medieval oh. ideology. But in the ancient world, uh, the magi, the word magic comes from similar words, similar roots. So to be a magician is to be a person who studied, um, they would have studied astrology, right? So usually we think of astrology as being kind of occultic. And, you know, I think that even in the ancient world it most likely was because God condemned it. Like in the book of um, Leviticus, it condemns magicians and astrologers and stuff like that. But these kinds of magicians in, in, uh, uh, in Babylon would have been people who they studied the stars because they believed that the stars were um, so they even the planets the word planet means a wandering star so they thought of the stars as actually angels or divine beings and sometimes the bible <coughs> kind of uses that that terminology in order to help you know because it was just common common knowledge um, but the uh, obviously the stars are not not angels and yet you know, we, we talk about the stars in the heavens, right? That comes from this idea that, you know, anything that's up there is closer to God. And, and so why do astrologers think that the, that the uh, constellations control our, uh, our destinies? It's because they believe that there's a divine connection between, a spiritual connection between the universe and things that are so far away from us. And maybe they didn't necessarily think that those were far away, but they just thought that they... they affected us on earth now as christians we know that astrology doesn't affect our uh our futures only god does right god has our futures in his hand but can god use something that the world thinks is, is true to speak to them and I, I would say that that absolutely yes because that's one of the reasons why the magi came looking for jesus because they said they saw the star they were looking in the heavens for an answer from, this, from the God of Israel to speak to the world about the coming of the, Israel, uh, the Israelite Messiah. Um, and so where would that star have appeared? I mean, I, I might have talked about this before. And, and the Bible doesn't give us specifics about this, but most likely, if you were going to look at a constellation that represented Judah, what constellation would that be? Leo. That's right, Leo, right. And it's, isn't it amazing that in the Bible, it, it actually describes some of the constellations. And even though thousands and thousands of years have passed, 
humans have been calling those constellations the same. So there's like the Pleiades. And, then, and so even Leo uh, was known to the Persians the, uh, and they associated that with the Lion of Judah. So the lion is a symbol for Judah. So then the star would have appeared in the constellation of Judah in order to signify that a king was born in, in Israel. Uh, again, the Bible doesn't go into those details, but it does give us some things that I think are in, in, uh, very helpful to understand, uh, to give us a, cl a clue at what it might have been. So, you know, my opinion is that it's not, um, that the star of Bethlehem was not an actual, like a star or a supernova, but it was a, con a conjunction of three planets, or at least a conjunction of three heavenly bodies that came together. So they lined up in a way that looked like they were a single star. So it was unusually bright because they were all lined up, you know, like Jupiter and Venus and maybe one other star. If they were right on top of each other, it, it looks a lot brighter and that would have been significant to the ancient people. No, and that's neither here nor there, but the whole idea of these magicians, they had some kind of knowledge. They looked to the skies for answers, but Daniel shows that the true answers come not from the stars, or the constellations, but from the God of Israel. So these people that we have, magicians and enchanters, they were people that were um, revered and consulted, and they, they, would, they would ask their opinions of what was going to happen and what the meaning of things were. So they were, they were pretty important people. Oh, right, right, right. Yeah, compared to our society today, because we, we live in a, a, a modern society, and as a modern society, science has replaced um, you know, uh, divination, and astrology, so because uh, in the ancient world, astrology and astronomy were basically the same thing, right? Mm -hmm. So sure, they could uh, study, you know, when was an eclipse going to happen? I mean, the Greeks they were able to figure that out, but they associated it with divine powers, right? So that you know, some uh, like I think it's the Chinese that thought that when the moon was going over the sun, there was a dragon eating the sun, and it was you know they were afraid and they had to scare it away, so they'd you know make lots of noise to try to scare the dragon away, so the sun would come back. But, so that's an association between astrology and astronomy. But since the Enlightenment, uh, those two things have parted ways. So astrology is considered to be bogus and false, and astro astronomy is considered a science. But these astronomers, these magicians and enchanters would have been both, and it would have been, they would have been well-revered. Yeah, that's a good way of thinking about it. So in fact, it, e and it included, you know, reading the entrails of animals and mm -hmm. all kinds of you know, stuff. But it was the yeah. idea was you could get supernatural knowledge from investigating the natural world. And the mm -hmm. modern world says, no, we just wanted to have the knowledge of the natural world. Well, I, Daniel I, I think that natural knowledge directly from yeah. supernatural. Yeah, that, that's true. I, I think that our, our secular world has said that, that it's not that they can't get supernatural knowledge, but, they're not, but they don't believe there is such thing. As, there's a lot of people who doesn't, they don't, just don't believe that there is anything other than the physical universe. Right? right? right. They want supernatural knowledge. Yeah, exactly. They, they say supernatural knowledge, what, that doesn't make sense. If you can't measure it, it doesn't exist. Well, but then that kind of excludes a lot of other things in life that we know are true. Like, can you prove that you love somebody? What is love? What is love? Is it, you know, can you measure? Yeah. So, I mean, if you could like do a scan of your brain and you can, and say this person has love because these chemicals are surging through their brain. You know, we just, we, yeah. So, and there's other things besides that, that are, um, that are interesting that things that can't be proven by science, but we accept, I mean, like morals, right? I mean, where do morals come from? You know, if, if uh, there's, and there's nothing but a physical universe, then morals do not exist, right? I mean, it's just the survival of the fittest. The strong makes the rules. Might makes right, right? And so the only thing that, that's wrong is, uh, you know, somebody makes a determination. So it's, you might say that murder is wrong, but if you're powerful enough, then murder isn't wrong anymore, right? It becomes, you know, a, a means uh, to an end. You know, if, if you're the victor, in the battle, then it's okay. <laughs> so, you know, uh, we know that uh, the spiritual world is, um, you know, God 
reveals himself through the natural world. But that's, that natural knowledge never is enough, right? You, I mean, you're never going to find everything you can find out about God through the natural world. All you can do is discover that God is, he, that he's intelligent, that he, um, he had a plan, he designed things well, uh, and that he's powerful. But, you know, that power kind of leads us to things like if your house gets destroyed by a hurricane and your family dies by an earthquake, you might say, well, if God does exist and he has the power to create all this, then why didn't he stop it when my family was in danger? And then you could say God is, you know, that he's uh, vengeful or hateful or, or angry. And, you know, the Bible reminds us that that's not the truth. It's partially true that God is powerful. I mean, no, he is ultimately powerful, but he's also loving. And that revealed knowledge is only known through scripture and through God's word. And so Daniel had that as opposed to just the other guys who only had the other thing. Just the nat- Well, they were looking for, like you said, natural knowledge to find out supernatural knowledge. But that supernatural knowledge was really just demonic knowledge. Because sure, sometimes the um, spiritual forces, which are real, can uh, be manipulated. In fact, that's what magic is. It's like you said, it's using natural things to control the supernatural world. So magicians often will say if you use a, a certain type of, you know, incantations or potions, or you say the right words, you can create something or make something or do something. So it's a type of power. So enchanters are similar, where they uh, a magician may may do actions that are kind of manipulate the spiritual world, but enchanters use words to to manipulate the spiritual world. So yeah, and you know, like uh, saying a spell, right? Um, you know, we in English when we think about a spell, we think of the word hocus pocus. Do you guys know where that came from? Mm-hmm. That's right. It came from the uh, the Latin phrase that was spoken by the priests in, during the Middle Ages in communion. They, as they spoke these words over the bread and the wine, it magically turned into the body and blood of Christ. Hoc est corp est meum. This is my body. So you say it fast, and it sounds like hocus pocus. And so that's what the people who would go to the churches in the Middle Ages heard this, and they said, if the priest said that over this and it turned it into the body and blood of Christ, maybe I can use special incantations and words to do other kinds of spells. To, and one of the reasons why they stopped giving the people the... Um, they, well, they don't put the bread in your hand. It's because in the Middle Ages, people would try to take it, thinking it, this is a piece of God, and I can use this in incantations. And magic, so they would place it in your mouth, and wait till you closed your mouth and ate it, so that they wouldn't be abused or used for some magical purposes. Because there's a lot of superstitions in the Middle Ages, and the Catholic what Church was trying. They, the they still do put it in your mouth. They won't. They're not supposed to put it in your hand. Okay. Well, then the last verse, and we'll finish up. Um, and Daniel remained there until the first year of King Cyrus. So he was in the. Kingdom of Babylon, and the first ki- uh, year of King Cyrus would have been, was it 530? And, uh, and so um, likely he retired in around 539, which is when, um, you know, uh, gr- historical grammatical scholars would say that the uh, author Daniel finished writing his book, which was 539 BC. So he would have been 81 or 82 at the time that he finished writing this. And so chapter 1 kind of wraps up the beginning of his uh, ministry as a young man at 14 and the end of his ministry when the Persian Empire took over and he was in a, under a new king. But he was also you know, so much older that he probably didn't uh, do a lot of work anymore. But then the rest of it is like everything in between. So he kind of goes back again and does flashbacks. So any final questions? Well, it's funny. Was Nebuchadnezzar the king of Philistia? No. So Nebuchadnezzar's uh, son took over afterwards and then his grandson Belshazzar was um, in in Babylon and he he comes in the story later so basically you see Daniel working for all the kings of the Babylonian Empire until the Persians take over and then he works for the king of Persia yeah okay so we'll start in chapter 2 next week